Let me bid you a very warm welcome to this Cavley lecture. My name is Peter Bruce. I'm the physical secretary of the Royal Society and one of the vice presidents uh, here. And it's a pleasure for me to host uh, this uh, lecture um, for today. Of course, we would normally be holding this in Carlton House Terrace um, rather than virtually. Um, the image you see before me, I'm afraid, isn't real. It's a virtual image of uh, one of the rooms in, in uh, our headquarters in Carlton House Terrace. Uh, but we're glad that we can, we can, we can have this event take place um, virtually, even if it isn't actually a physical event um, in our headquarters. I should also say this is the 2019 uh, Cavley Lecture, which would normally have been held in 20, 2020. So we're somewhat catching up uh, with events. Now, the Cavley Lecture in Medal is one of a number of medals, awards and prizes that the Royal Society uh, bestows on people uh, for excellence in science and technology, uh, identified for scientific achievements across, across the world. In this particular case, the Cavley Medal itself is in recognition of science and engineering relevant uh, to the environment. Now, after the lecture, there will be a live Q&A, which will be using the platform Slido. So I hope you'll uh, take part in that after the lecture. So let me now introduce the, the winner of the 2019 Cavley uh, Lecture uh, and Medal, Professor Ian Chapman. Ian is currently CEO of the UK Atomic Energy Authority and Director of Cullen Centre for Fusion Energy, a position he's held since October 2016. His primary research interests are in understanding and controlling instabilities in fusion plasma, something of course that goes right to the heart of, of um, uh, being able to control plasmas and therefore control uh, nuclear fusion. His research is characterized by bringing together um, cutting edge experimental results with numerical modeling to really get to the underlying fundamental understanding of the plasma physics. His work has been recognized by a number of awards previously, the American Physical Science Society Early Career Prize in 2017, the European Physical Society Early Career Prize in 2014, and the Applied Physics Young Science Prize in 2012. So without any further ado, I would like now to pass over to Ian to present his lecture, uh, which I'm sure will be very stimulating and enjoyable for all of us. The title of his lecture is Putting the Sun in a Bottle, The Path to Delivering Sustainable Fusion Power. Ian. So good evening, everybody. Um, before I start, I really wanted to thank the Royal Society for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, and I'll tell you about um, the, the path to delivering sustainable fusion power. I'm gonna start with this picture because I think it really sums up a lot of why what we do is so important. Um, this was taken two years ago now um, in, in Washington, in the US. Um, and half of California was on fire at the time. Uh, and and yet, you know, three days later, that had somehow become normalised, and people had accepted that there were wildfires all around them, and they'd jump in a car and probably a diesel car and go and play golf. Um, this is, is not doctored. This photograph, it's it's real. This is this shows you. It sums up people's attitude to climate change in large, um, and it's why. It's so important that, that governments take action, that policymakers take action, that we as scientists take our responsibility to find solutions to this, this massive problem. A few more words on, on exactly how big this problem is. So 2020, despite all the, the, the global lockdowns due to the pandemic and the easing of, of um, travel, still saw uh, the hottest year on record about the same as 2016 um, and you can look at how the global temperature is increasing and it's really very stark. It took about 200 years to get to the temperature rise we see in about 1990 and then only 30 years later we've doubled that. Um, what does the next 30 years hold in store and, and, and that's the really big question. Um, here's just two examples of how 
that is translating to our, our weather systems. There were 29 tropical storms in the in the North Atlantic in the Caribbean this year. 29, one a fortnight. These were the sort of things that used to happen three or four times a year. Now they're happening twice a month. Um, and then this temperature uh, plot at the top shows you the temperature in the Arctic Circle this year, where some parts of the Arctic Circle over the year experienced a rise of six degrees, six degrees in a year. It's, uh, it's astonishing. Um, we really must take action. Um, so it's really good that the government have a policy aiming for net zero by 2050. What does that really mean? Let's talk about uh, net zero by 2050 just for a minute. This shows you our, our energy consumption for electricity, for transport, for everything um, as a function of time. Um, and you can see that today in 2020, we burn about 11 megatons of oil equivalent in terms of fossil fuels, gas, oil, and coal. Um, that in itself is about 50% more than we burnt just 20 years ago. And in 2000, we knew about climate change. Uh, and 20 years later, we're burning 50% more fossil fuels than, than we did just 20 years ago. That, that's really astonishing. <laughs> um, so, so how are we going to address this? If we're going to go to net zero, so none of this is going to exist, all of these fossil fuels will be displaced, and don't worry about growth, just think about displacing that to start with. Um, how are we going to achieve that? Well, as I say, there's about 11,000 um, megatons of oil equivalent to displace. And roughly, there are 11,000 days until we get to 2050. Um, so that means we need to displace a megaton of oil equivalent every day. Well, what is that, right? Well, that's equivalent to one nuclear power station. So this is size well B in the UK. Um, one of them needs to be built every day in the world for 30 years or if you want to look at offshore wind this is uh, Hornsey the biggest offshore wind farm in the, in the whole world um, so it's equivalent to that that amount of power output every day for 30 years um, either of these you know roughly in handfuls would cost about 10 10 billion so the world needs to spend about 10 billion per day to displace that level of um, fossil fuel consumption and this assumes that all extra demand is covered through carbon-free sources. And you can see the demand is continuing to increase and increase and increase. This is something like 4% of global GDP every single day um, needs to be spent, right? So it's this is big money, and it really requires concerted effort and big action. Um, and this is a global problem, okay? It, it's much like COVID pandemic. You can't think of a solution for the UK because it's irrelevant. The UK is 1% of the energy market, or less than 1% of the energy market. Um, if we went net zero as a country, it doesn't affect climate change, it just doesn't matter. Um, so we need to have global solutions that work for the whole world, and the whole world needs to be part of this. Just like finding vaccines to COVID, there's no good finding a vaccine in one country, it doesn't matter. You need to find a, a vaccine across the world before you're going to have any effect on a pandemic. And this is a global problem that needs a solution that works everywhere. So what is that solution, right? Um, well, Stephen Hawking was asked, um, this is the last page of his last ever book published posthumously. He was asked, what world changing idea, small or big, would you like to see implemented by hum humanity? This is easy. I'd like to see the development of fusion power. <clears throat> and there are loads of reasons that he said that. And, and of course, it's easy to say, it's really hard to do, but loads of reasons why fusion has enormous potential it's carbon free to start with, you're not, you're not waiting. Um, it's reliable base load. If we can get it to work, it's not waiting for the, the wind to blow or the sun to shine. Um, it's effectively unlimited fuel. Our fuel comes from seawater and from lithium. And we have a lot of seawater and a lot of lithium. Um, it's low manageable waste. There is some waste, but it's, it's manageable. Um, it's inherently safe. There is no risk of a sort of chain reaction event, a runaway event that just cannot happen in fusion. Um, and really importantly, it's low land use. Um, and this this sort of energy density is a very important issue. Um, you look at countries like I don't know, India or Indonesia, they get a lot of sunshine, but, but PV won't work there on full scale because the population density is so large. So we also need high energy density sources and, and fusion offers potential for that. Uh, even, even if I consumed a lot more electricity than I do today, for the rest of my life, for the next 60 years, 
all the fuel I need through fusion would come from the water that, that fills a bathtub and the lithium in two laptop batteries. I, I own two laptops. My wife had a bath last night. That's all the fuel I need for the rest of my life. Um, so incredibly high yield, very high energy density, low land use. But we've known all that for, for a long time now, but we still don't have working fusion here on Earth. Um, and the, the primary reason for that is that it's really, really hard. Um, you know, fusion works. We have the, the, the biggest fusion, fusion reactor in, in the solar system is our sun. It happens in, inside the sun, in all of our stars. Um, but it's happening in the sun because of the sun's mass, because it's so massive, it has this enormous gravitational force, which pulls the, the, the hydrogen, which we use gas uh, isotopes of hydrogen, forces it so close that it will fuse and produce energy. We, we obviously cannot recreate the mass of the sun here on Earth. So instead, we have a much smaller um, volume of fuel, and we have to make it 10 times hotter than the sun to give it the same uh, energy to overcome the coulombic repulsion and make the make the fuel fuse together and release energy so temperatures of 150 200 million degrees which just sounds crazy right but we do it all the time and i'll, I'll explain how now when you have a fuel here denoted by this sort of pink donut in the middle that's the the fuel two types of hydrogen that we uh, combine in the center of a, a fusion power station um, that fuel is operating at 150 million degrees. You cannot, obviously cannot let it touch the wall of the power station, it would just melt. So um, we have to sort of um, hold it stationary with big magnets. These are some of the largest magnets that you'll find in the world. And they effectively levitate that fuel, keep it stationary, hold it away from the wall so that the fuel can keep fusing and not interact with any of the wall. Um, we do that in a machine called a tokamak. This was a, a Soviet, uh, invention, hence Russian words, a toroidal confinement chamber in a toroidal shape. And this was an invention back in the 70s. Um, and on the back of that, we've built big tokamaks around the world, and we're embarking on the biggest scientific collaboration ever undertaken by humanity to prove that this really does work on a commercial scale. Right, so why now? We've known about even tokamaks since the 1970s. Um, why is there excitement in the field of fusion today? I think there are three reasons for that. Um, one is the, the pull. You know, the market really wants to see carbon-free energy sources come to fruition, and the public consciousness is as high now as it's ever been. Um, but the second and the biggest thing, really, is that fusion needs to demonstrate that it works, that we can get a lot more power out than we put in. We have made fusion happen here on Earth um, at a device that, that we operate here, here just outside Oxford, we, um, we produce 16 megawatts of fusion power, which is not nothing. It's a few wind turbines. It's a good, a good proof of principle. Um, but we had to put 25 megawatts in to get the fuel hot in the first place. And obviously, you know, that's not a net, uh, not, not a net energy producer. So we need to demonstrate that we get a lot more power out than we put in to get the fuel hotter than the sun in the first place. Um, we are building a facility called ETA. I'll tell you more about that in a minute, where we put 50 megawatts in and it produces 500 megawatts out. 500 megawatts is like the consumption of Leeds or Liverpool, medium-sized cities. So that will show that fusion really can produce net, net energy um, and can work on an appropriate scale. And the third reason is that there must be private money going into this. To date, fusion has largely been publicly funded. That doesn't mean that it's gonna go at the pace that's needed and it doesn't mean that it's gonna propagate into the market. You need the market to want to invest. Um, and in the last few years, particularly, we've seen a strong increase in private investment in the sector. There's now about two billion invested in about 40 different startup companies. And even if I go back five or six years, it was largely sort of philanthropists who wanted to make a difference. You know, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and people like that investing. Um, now we're beginning to see oil and gas companies investing, energy companies investing, venture capitalists investing, sovereign wealth funds. And they're investing in the right types of startup companies, you know, really credible outfits spun out from Oxford or from MIT, you know, really capable, credible people. Um, so the market has appetite for investment in this space as well, increasing appetite. And I say that the fusion is now entering the delivery era because of this. This is a machine called ETA. It's being built in the south of France, but it is a global collaboration. If you look at the partners down at the bottom and you're good with flags, um, Europe, 
as the host is the the biggest participant pays 45 percent then all the others pay nine percent china india japan south korea russia and the us now you might look at that list and think well they're not exactly natural collaborators but um but they really are working together this is a like i said a global problem that needs global solutions um, and this is the biggest scientific endeavor undertaken ever by humanity um, this machine will cost about 20 billion pounds by the time that it's finished it's a, a really huge effort and it requires the capability and capacity of the whole world you know there is now a new supply chain developed because of this facility new companies new factories um, all sorts of new capability that just did not exist beforehand now does exist um, and this facility is now three quarters built um, uh, the aim is that it's complete by 2025. Most of the components now exist and they're being shipped to France and being assembled. So the assembly has now begun. And like I said at the start, you put 50 megawatts in, it produces 500 megawatts out. So it's an enormously exciting time for our field. To give you some sense of scale, this building in the middle, which is where the, the actual um, fusion tokamak will sit, is about 120 meters long, about 80 meters deep. It comes about 80 meters out of the ground. So that's basically Wembley. It's the same size as a, as a football stadium. It's the same size as Wembley. And a bit like Wembley, it's about twice over budget and twice behind schedule, but it is a bit more complicated than a football stadium. But ITER is not designed to produce um, electricity. It will not put, put electricity onto the grid. It's a demonstration that you can get a lot more power out than you put in. So what do we still have to overcome to get to, to, get to this, to get to a power station? Uh, I always say this breaks down to five big challenges. The first we've already talked about. The first big challenge is that you must have a fuel which is 10 times hotter than the centre of the sun. Um, this is real footage from the inside of JET, um, where we are operating this fuel at about 150 million degrees. And when we're at those extreme temperatures, um, here this is this is a, a deuteron, so heavy hydrogen, whizzing around the inside of the vessel. Um, and because it's going so fast, it has so much energy, it has a cross-section with a triton, which is very heavy hydrogen. Those two isotopes of hydrogen, they react, they fuse, and they produce helium. The helium is an inert gas, it's charged, so it stays inside the magnetic field and keeps the reaction going, and a neutron. And the neutrons are hugely energetic, loads of them which is great for producing electricity but it gives rise to the second big challenge which is that here you have the most intense neutron source on earth with the highest flux and fluence of of very energetic neutrons you can imagine and as those neutrons pass through whatever you've built the machine from the steel or the tungsten they will cause little displacements in the lattice of atoms and when you get those displacements in the lattice they change the structural properties the strength the brittleness the creep things like that and that affects the lifetime the third big challenge is the most extreme heat load problem that you can think of. At the middle, where the fusion is happening, you have a heat which is about 150 million degrees. Then two meters away, you have a wall which can't be more than a few hundred degrees or it will melt. And then just behind that, you have a cryo plant, which is almost at absolute zero. So you've gone from hotter than the sun, 10 times hotter than the sun, to four Kelvin, almost absolute zero in the space of two meters. This is a huge challenge to deal with that. The fourth challenge is, is how we get our fuel. So deuterium we just get from seawater, heavy hydrogen. Tritium is radioactive, but it has short half-life, a half-life of about 12 years. So we don't find it naturally, we have to make it. Now, this is meant to represent a blanket of lithium. We put lithium around the outside of the machine. As the neutrons come out, they pass through that lithium and they will react and produce tritium. And then you have to take that blanket out into a, a processing plant at the back you extract the tritium and you freeze it into tiny little bullets and fire these pellets in to keep the, the reaction going. And this is like, you know, you have a fire, you have to keep throwing wood on the fire, keep throwing fuel on the fire to keep it going. Just like that, we have to keep putting tritium in. So we make the tritium, we freeze it and inject it into the, into the reactor to keep it going. And then the fifth challenge is all about availability. So as I said, we produce neutrons that activates the wall. It gets radioactive short, but, but it does get active. So you can't send people in to fix things, which means you need robots like this to be able to go in, fix a component if it's gone wrong and then get out quickly. And that availability is key because it really affects the cost of electricity the consumer feels. So there are five big challenges there that we have to address before we have commercially viable fusion power stations. 
Now, it so happens that the UK programme is set up to address those five big challenges. Let me talk through all of the capability we have in the UK. So the first thing we talked about was a really hot fuel in the middle. We operate JET, which is a, a European facility here in the UK, on behalf of the European community. It is the biggest and the best fusion machine in the world today. And I'll tell you a bit more about JET in a minute. Then we have to worry about how you get the heat out of the machine. We've just completed building a UK only device, a machine we call Mast Upgrade. And again, I'll show you more about that later, which is tailored precisely to look at how you might get the heat out of a fusion device. Then the neutrons interact with the wall. So you need to understand the materials property. We have a materials research facility expressly to look at how neutrons affect um, wall materials or, or um, coating or armor materials. And then we have um, a facility which is designed to test those materials on a, on a meter by meter scale. So put them in the conditions of a fusion reactor in a vacuum with a large magnetic field and a lot of heat and test that they work and test welds and brazes and things like that. We need to produce our own tritium. We are currently building the largest tritium research facility in the world, a facility we call HEAT here in the UK. And then lastly, we need to have robots that can maintain the, the inside of the power plant. We have the largest uh, nuclear robotics um, facility in, in Europe, at least, a facility we call RACE. And then we have to stitch all of that together which requires holistic integrated design using big computer codes. We need an advanced computing sort of digital design capability. And that allows us to design reactors. And I'll tell, about, I'll tell you about the UK's own reactor design program, and we'll touch on the a European effort to, to design um, power stations as well. This is a little video of JET. As I said, JET is the, the biggest fusion facility in the world. In a minute, you'll see a person in coveralls to give you some sense of scale. Um, so here's a person. This is about 10 meters up, 10 meters across, um, the biggest fusion facility that exists today. And the only one, the only one with, with capability to run with tritium, with a robotic maintenance system, the only one of its scale, the only one that's really representative of the conditions that we will experience in ITER. And so the whole world needs JET and JET will continue, we think, to operate until ITER begins in 2025. Um, and it's a really exciting time to be working on JET. Um, as I say, JET is the only device that's capable of mixing tritium and deuterium together to get real fusion conditions. We haven't done that since 1997. Um, this year, for the first time in 24 years, we'll be doing those experiments again. Um, the black line here shows you the, the best performance that we've ever had. This is the, the fusion, the number of neutrons that come out, which essentially is like fusion power averaged over time. We only run jet for a few seconds because and I'll tell you about the magnets in a minute. So the magnets are, are copper, they get very hot. And so we have to turn the device off after a few seconds. Now, that's because jet was built in the early 80s, when the only magnets we could use were copper magnets. Today, we have superconducting magnets, superconducting magnets can run essentially in steady state and ITER will be built with superconducting magnets, so it'll be able to run for a long time. So we could get good performance at peak, but when you try and sustain it, the performance weakened. So you'd lose control of the fuel. This was when we used to have a carbon facing wall. So the whole of the inner skin of the device was made of carbon fiber composite, which is great. It takes a lot of heat flux, it's cheap, it's easy to machine. Unfortunately for, for um, fusion devices, carbon has a strong affinity for hydrogen. It's good for us, we're made of hydrocarbons, but um, when you have radioactive hydrogen in tritium inside the vessel, the carbon wall sort of hoovers it up. It sucks up this tritium and embeds in the wall. And you don't, the regulator doesn't want you to have a lot of radioactive material stuck in, inside your wall facing components. And so we had to change the materials. We changed them to tungsten and beryllium um, for, for different reasons. They both have a high melt temperature and they don't have a strong affinity for hydrogen. So we did that um, replacement, which is a massive project in JET about um, 10 years ago. 2010. And since then, we've been trying to get back to this performance. Um, in the last year, we now exceeded the performance that we've, we've set new world records for um, performance with deuterium only fuel in, in the summer just gone. Um, and on the back of that, we're now ready to put tritium back into the machine. So we will show that the design for ITA is robust and ITA will reach its goals based on experiments that we do in JET um, this summer. Let me tell you a little bit of science about one of the challenges that we face. So this is a cross section of that donut. Um, 
and the hot bit is right in the middle but like any fluid it experiences some turbulence so hot material gets out towards the edge um, and near the edge we see a strong gradient building up in the, the density and the temperature of the fuel and that strong gradient leads to some explosive instabilities and you can see that this is um, camera image of the the hot fuel on the inside of the reactor and every now and then you see a burst you see just then happen this burst of energy coming out so here's another burst and every time that happens um, it takes quite a lot of the stored energy and the heat and it throws it against the wall now when you build um when you build machines on the scale of ITER, each one of those instabilities, those explosive eruptions that happens at the edge, and a bit like a solar flare, right? So this is happening in the sun all the time. You will have seen flares coming out of the sun. Um, every time that happens in a machine of the scale of ITER, um, it could take a lot of stored energy and throw it against the wall. And that could really damage the inside of the machine. So we need a clever way of dealing with these instabilities. So what's happening here? Well, I use the analogy of a saucepan. So you have a fuel on the inside, you heat it up, that causes an increase in pressure. So you see the, the gas pressure rising and rising and rising, and eventually it would cause the lid of the pan to pop off and the, the gas to erupt. And that's essentially what's happening inside the tokamak. The pressure is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you get one of these explosive events where a lot of the energy can escape, um, and that potentially could go out and hit the wall. So how do you deal with that? Well. If this was your pan on your hob at home, how would you deal with it? You'd put a lid in, or you should either open a vent on the lid or jam a spoon in, something which can allow the steam to get out gradually, but still keep, a, still keep the water really hot and the fuel really hot. And that is essentially what we try to do in fusion as well. We find a way to release enough energy at the edge, but keep the core hot. So how do we do that? Well, we had an idea of how to do that by essentially um, ergodizing the magnetic field right at the edge and so allowing the the heat to seep out so we came up with a way of uh, of doing that with new magnetic coils to to cause this this exhaust pipe allow some of the the heat to get out um, and we predicted what the magnetic field structure should look like and when we made predictions like this to be honest most of the community me included looked at this structure and said well it's not it's never going to really look like that it's never going to have these very strange lobe structures and the magnetic field won't really look like that in practice it just seems very strange to to have these these little fingers sticking out at the edge of the at the edge of the fuel but that's what the prediction said so we went away and tested it um, and here's some genuine genuine camera um, footage and you can see it really does look like this so you see these fingers sticking out down at the bottom here and these fingers are the exhaust valve so that's the spoon um, underneath the lid allowing the heat to get out gradually so um, our prediction was exactly right this is exactly what we see and because our predictions are right we know that this is going to work um, so this has now been adopted by ETA and this is how they will control some of those uh, instabilities at the edge in, in fusion reactors so that's the science but how are we actually going to take this to market so like I said I'm convinced ETA will work ETA's five years from turning on and it will demonstrate that fusion really can work at scale here on Earth. But it is not economical. It's really expensive. So how do we take fusion to market at a cost that the consumer wants to buy? Now, the cost of electricity, of course, is a big driver for energy. The cost of electricity in fusion um, looks like this. And the big drivers here are the availability. So how many days a year does, does a fusion power station operate? Then there's the thermodynamic efficiency, just like every, every thermal plant, a gas plant or a coal plant, fission plant, um, the power output, the performance of the fuel, and the number of machines you build. So the more you build, the price comes down. But really dominant in this is the capital, is how much you pay to build the machine and how much you pay to finance it. And if you look at the, the costs, um, the vast majority of it is the capital up front. The fuel is effectively irrelevant. The decommissioning is effectively irrelevant. You know, you do have to pay for replacing parts, but really the, the vast majority of the spend is the upfront overnight bill costs. And, and we see that with fission. You know, we're building Hinkley Point at the moment, but it, it costs circa 20 billion. And it took a long time to get that project agreed. Um, and, it, and, it, and it takes a long time to build facilities of that scale. So really you want to drive down the cost and the scale to allow um, propagation into the market more readily. 
So let's look at where those overnight costs lie. So don't really worry about any of these terms at the bottom. This is the fraction of the capital cost, how much you spend to build the machine. And you can see in both ITER and projected power plants, the vast majority, the vast majority of your costs are the big magnets that you use to hold this fuel, to keep the fuel stationary and the cryostat to cool those superconducting magnets and the buildings and the site. So it's a big, big building. So that's the vast majority of the cost, two thirds of the cost go in those two things. So ideally you want smaller magnets in a smaller building so that you can strip out billions from the cost. And that was the genesis of a, uh, an invention that we came up with in the UK of the spherical tokamak. Um, now, this makes much more efficient use of the magnetic field. The magnetic field in ITER is, these are the biggest magnets that you can imagine, the biggest magnets that have ever been built. Um, and they produce enormous magnetic fields, but it's not a very efficient use of that magnetic field. In the spherical tokamak, so a conventional machine, ITER is a sort of conventional ring donut. In the spherical tokamak, we take that and we squeeze it together. So it looks more spherical. I, I use the analogy of a, an apple with the core removed. So it's still a torus, but it has a very thin gap in the middle. And you can see that in this um, cut through of our machine, a very narrow gap down the middle and the fuel would sit around that very narrow pipe in the middle. Um, and that makes much more efficient use of your magnets. So you can, you can build a smaller device using much cheaper magnets and produce in theory, the same fusion power, but despite stripping out enormous costs, right? So we built the first one of these in the world. We still have one of the best in the world, but right, the rest of the world have looked at that and gone, well, that's a lovely idea, but the boundary condition doesn't change. So the fuel in the middle still has to be 150 million degrees or fusion doesn't happen. If you take that sort of heat source and you put it into a smaller box, the chances of melting the wall of that box are obviously much higher. So you've taken the, the, the problem that was already a big problem, how you get the heat out, and you've made it even harder. So how are we going to get the heat out of these compact machines without, without melting the wall? And that we held our hands up and said, yeah, that's a really big challenge. But in the mid-2000s, we came up with an idea of how we were going to solve that. Uh, we've now spent the last seven years um, building, constructing, and now commissioning a device to test exactly how to get the heat out. And if, if it works, um, it will reduce the heat flux incident on the wall by a factor of 10. And almost every field, every domain, if you get a factor of 10 improvement, it makes a huge difference, right? If, I don't know, a mobile phone company came up with a better battery that lasted 10 times longer than everybody else, everybody would buy that product, right? So a factor of 10 improvement in just about any field really matters. Um, and that machine is complete. And here it is. These are the same size people that you saw um, earlier in JET. And you can see how tiny this facility is. It's a really compact device, but capable of sustaining the same temperature of fuel as on the inside of, of JET or ITER. Um, and the reason that we can do that is this really clever exhaust system that we've designed. This has never been tested before in the world. We are about to turn this facility on. In fact, we've finished commissioning and we are beginning to run plasmas. We'll be getting up to really hot plasmas by the summer this year. And we hope to prove that we can drop the heat flux incident on the wall by a factor of 10. And that will be a huge advance for our field. And on the back of that, here in the UK, um, last year, um, the government committed a couple of 200 million um, to begin the concept design of a fusion power station, a fusion prototype power station. So the aim of this is to produce predictable net electricity. So it put, puts power onto the grid, really puts electricity onto the grid, but aiming fundamentally to have a lower capital cost than any other approach that we might take to, to, to building fusion power stations. And there are, you know, every ETA partner, so I talked through all those ETA partners, China have a plan, Europe have a plan, the US have a plan, um, Korea have a plan. They all have different variants of how they're gonna build power stations. And here in the UK, we also have a variant, and that is to go for you know, high ingenuity, high innovation, smaller, more compact, ergo much cheaper. Um, and the, the thesis is that that will allow propagation into the market much more readily because you don't have to find the large upfront overnight costs that you would have to if you're building on the scale of a football stadium every time. Um, this is a really ambitious program, audacious almost, where we're aiming for about 20 years from now to have delivered 
um, a prototype power station, so around 2040. It's split up into three tranches. We're in this first, first phase now where we're doing concept design. We've just begun a process to find a site to, to house this. Um, we're beginning to think about the, the future commercial model and the, the private sector partners that we'll have to deliver this to market. Then we go into a detailed engineering design, um, all the infrastructure planning around the site to the point of getting a license that we can build the machine and then we construct targeting completion in the uh, early 2040s. Now that's what the UK is doing, um, but there are lots of different endeavours. In, in Europe, uh, essentially, uh, the European plan is to take a scaled up version of ITER. Um, so it's an ITER-like design on a slightly bigger scale. The Chinese are taking more or less the same approach where they, they take ITER, make it slightly bigger, perhaps a bit more aggressive than the European plan and, and aiming to deliver this by around 2040 time scale. Um, and then there are also many private sector companies also looking at this, a couple of them particularly looking at very, very large magnetic field solutions using next generation superconducting magnets. Um, one of them, Tokamak Energy here in the UK. So I hope I've given you a, a whistle stop tour there of where fusion is. I'm gonna end with this brilliant quote. I, I often get asked at presentations like this, when will fusion be ready? Um, this is Lev Artsimovich, one of the inventors of the, the Tokamak in the Soviet Union, who was asked this question back in the 70s in a press conference, when will we have fusion? Um, and very wisely, he didn't say it will be X years. He said, fusion will be ready when society needs it. I think that stands true today, just as much as it did then. And the, and the world really needs clean, carbon-free sources of energy. And fusion has enormous potential to be part of that portfolio. Thank you very much. And hopefully I can take some questions from you now. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, that was a great talk. And uh, really thanks for that. Uh, a great mix of some exciting science, as well as uh, giving us the context and the importance, of course, of uh, uh, of the decarbonisation agenda and the way and the, the role that uh, fusion will undoubtedly play in this uh, in the future. Um, we've had a, a lot of questions coming in, as you as you can imagine. And let me just take also this opportunity to to uh, welcome uh, everyone who's joining us for this talk and for this Q Q and A around the world. It's great to have you with us. Uh, so let me just start off with um, with this one, which is a question really about the extent to which computer simulations can help you uh, in your endeavors and the relationship to the ultimate experimental results. So uh, Alex McMurray asks, what are the limitations to our computational simulations? How much do we expect to be surprised by the results from ITER? And he gives an example. I understand that the H mode was not expected prior to being discovered in experiments. So, so that's the core of the question, Ian. There's a fusion aficionado out there who knows about... <laughs> I thought so you'd like that one as a kid off. Uh, I've and got one on Brexit in a minute, so I'll give you that oh, one. Oh, good. We'll go to Brexit. <laughs> so h mode. you know, I was talking about those explosive events. That, that's what happens in what we call high confinement mode, H mode is when the pressure gets too high, basically. And, and you're entirely right, that wasn't expected. It hadn't been predicted, and it's it's taken us a long time to understand what triggers it and what causes that effect to happen. Um, I'm certain that we will experience things in ITER that we've not predicted. Um, that's the nature of doing experiments. Uh, so we're bound we're bound to find out some things that, that we're not 100% expecting. And if I were betting, I would say the thing that, that will cause the most difference between today's machines and what we see in ITER um, is the presence of a, a dominant source of the alpha particles. So I talked about deuterium and tritium reacting and producing a helium. Now, in present day machines, the helium is a very small fraction of the input power. In ITER, it will be the dominant source of the heating power. So there'll be a little bit of injected power to get the fusion going. But then actually, after a while, you turn off the injected power and, and the, the reaction is kept going by the presence of these um, helium alpha particles. So that will be a new dynamic that we've never been able to test before. We've never been in that parameter space. Um, and we've got lots of simulations of what we expect to happen. Indeed, that's some of my own scientific research has been around exactly that subject. But I'm sure that there will be things that happen that are not exactly as we predicted. That's, that's kind of the nature, the beauty of science. Um, so yes, I'm expecting a few surprises. That's super. Thanks, Ian. So here's another one actually related to ITER, or interestingly, ITER's successor, DEMO. And the question um, from Alex Wilmer is, is DEMO successor to ITER planned 
to be to use the same superconducting magnets, or will uh, it use high temperature superconductors in the magnetic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very good question. So, so ETA is conventional low temperature superconducting mm -hmm. magnet, the same type essentially that you would find in MRI scanners and things like that, which is sort of very known technology. Um, there are a number of designs which are low technical risk and therefore they adopt today's technology. And that's certainly the European power plant design is adopting today's technology. So it's assuming low temperature superconductors. But at the same time, other people are looking at high temperature superconductors, which have um, lots of advantages. It, and you can get a very, very high magnetic fields with high temperature superconducting magnets. So it's, it's a very attractive option for fusion. It's, it's earlier in its genesis, but if we can get it to work, it's very attractive for fusion. So um, people are pursuing both paths. Okay, great, thank you. So here's a, an interesting sort of technical question from Simon Caron. Uh, how do you measure a temperature of 50 million kelvins? <laughs> uh, what kind of thermograph medic camera do you use? What yeah, kind of cryogenic cooling do you need to keep the tokamak cool? Uh, so that's the sort of essence of the question. Yeah. So how do we measure it? So, so one, one way that we measure it, for instance, is that we pass essentially a laser beam through the, the middle of the plasma and we have two colours and um, bounce them off a mirror at the top and back down to the bottom. So, so they just go through um, windows. And then we can look at the slight um, variation in, in sort of refraction of that beam and how the, the, the light has changed path. And that from that, you can backwards infer properties about the temperature and the density of the fuel by looking at the you know you have a control line and then a line that goes through the through the middle of the fuel and that allows you to ascertain the profile of the um, temperature and the density so that's one way but there are a number of different sort of non-intrusive diagnostic systems that we have like that which allow you to to, to do this and on total there's about a hundred different diagnostics um, on a fusion machine okay great so now here's the brexit question um, is Brexit and indeed actually global politics and more widely impacting on the delivery of ETAR? I mean, you know, politics gets into everything. Is it, is it a major barrier to the progress of, of, of the science and technology? Yeah, po politics gets into everything and, you know, the world events get into everything when you're doing decadal projects like this. So um, there was uncertainty around the UK's participation in ETAR, um, but before Christmas as part of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, we've agreed to become an associated country to the Euratom Research and Training Programme, and Euratom is the, the programme which um, uh, dictates the European participation in ETA. So the UK will remain a participant, is the long and short of it. So Brexit, thankfully, um, we found a route through that, thanks to lots of hard work from um, the UK government and, and the Commission on, on establishing a continued collaboration. Um, but more broadly, sort of geopolitics and and what goes on in the world certainly does affect us. Uh, so I give you give you two examples of that. One was um, when the tsunami hit the coast of Japan. Mm. One of the big magnets that are, are needed for ITER, they were being fabricated on the north uh, northeast coast of Japan, and so that that put back that program by two years because the factory was destroyed. Um, and then another one. Do you remember a few years ago that there was a bridge collapsed in Italy? Mm. Um, that bridge actually collapsed next door to one of the factories building se segments of the, the vacuum vessel for ITA. So that these things happen in the world when you're doing decadal projects. And so that, that influences timeline and influences your ability to build, build components because there's a problem with a factory somewhere. So, of course, yeah, we're, we're exposed to things like that. So as an actually follow up from that, actually, interesting question from Paul Klein here, because you mentioned Fukushima. I guess the essence of the question is to, to what extent things like the Chernobyl accident and Fukushima, although obviously they're completely different technology, but you know, to the wider public, does that sort of um, uh, perhaps, shall we say, um, concerns around nuclear uh, fission uh, spill over into people's perception of, of fusion as a, as, a, you know, as a commercial uh, um, a way forward for, for um, generating electricity? Yeah, un undoubtedly, undoubtedly it does because it's it's nuclear physics and people associate something. The word nuclear has a, a connotation and association. When when I ask people, about, when I tell people that I'm involved in fusion, you know, people will their immediate thing is a razor maybe or a blend of two different types of cuisine. They don't usually think of nuclear, and those that do think of it do have this association with fission, of course. That fundamentally, it's such a it, it's such a different process that. With, with fission, of course, you run this risk of chain reaction. You run the risk of what happened at Chernobyl and losing control and, and a runaway event. 
Um, and, and at heart, that's because you put something like two weeks or three weeks worth of fuel into the reactor. Um, and so if you lose control of it, it just carries on for two or three weeks. In fusion, you have something like 15 seconds worth of fuel in there. So if you want to turn it off, it turns off almost instantly. I mean, my whole career is about trying to keep it going. Um, so turning it off is very easy, actually. Uh, so there is just there is no way of having a chain reaction like event like that in fusion. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so I think the other one of the other questions, although you touched on this quite a lot actually in your talk, but it, I think this slightly extends the question. So the question I showed from George Williamson is: a successful deuterium tritium fusion reactor will generate a very high neutron flux, which I know you talked a lot about and the damage that's incurred. The question here is. You know, taking that into account, will it really be possible to build a reliable reactor that will have long, long lifetime? You know, can you mitigate those 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 uh, radiation damage events, especially from neutrons, to to a point when it becomes viable? So, so um, th 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 it's a very complicated answer to a, si a simple question. Um, so, so yes, we can mitigate it. We put shielding around. You effectively have sacrificial surfaces um, between the things that, that are really integral, the magnets, the vacuum vessel, the cryostat, the things at the back, which you really must protect because that determines the, the long lifetime of the plant. Other things which are, are nearer to the fuel will certainly get damaged. And then the, 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 the issue is not um, whether they survive for six years or 10 years. The issue is how quickly can you replace them? that issue about robotics and being able to maintain the plant is essential and i talked about the availability hitting the levelized cost of electricity to what the consumers pay it really matters in a, in a fission station if 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 the plant went down for a month it would affect the share price of the company you know so it really matters to the cost of electricity so designing for maintainability designing for high availability is essential and whether that component lasts five years or seven years it's not that doesn't really matter that much. You just need to be able to get in and replace it quickly and have a plan, a design that you're designed for, for maintenance. But, you, but, but you're talking about a lifetime that's at least months or years. I mean, you're not having to replace oh, it yeah. a week or anything like this. Yeah, okay, that's, that's yeah. good. The, the plan so, for power stations, the things that are right on the first wall armor is, is of years, three or four years. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting question here about whether um, this technology will be uh, effectively too expensive for developing economies in Asia and Africa, will they be able to access this sort of technology um, for their electricity systems? Yeah, uh, that, 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 that's a very complicated question about trying to predict what mar market dynamics will look like in 20 years time. Um, our aspiration, of course, is that, as I said, this is low land use and effectively unlimited fuel. Mm. So it should, it should be the sort of thing that can go everywhere. And then whether it can enter a market is all down to the overnight costs. So it's that we have to drive down the, the capital costs because that's what will preclude this being a technology which is available to developing countries is the overnight costs. Um, but, you know, they can build gas plants and we're talking that's billions, billions of, of sterling to, to build a gas plant. So there's there's definitely a route to raising that sort of money. Um, so, um so yeah, I, I'm relatively confident that we'll find a way to, to be able to propagate the entire global market. Got to make it work, of course. Yes, absolutely. No, that's, uh, I think that's very good and very, very clear. Um, I've got a question here from Paul Davis. Is ITER output, the 500 megawatts you mentioned, is that the thermal output or is that the electrical output that you're actually getting? Yeah, that, that's, that's thermal power. Um, we, uh, so ITER will not put electricity onto the grid. Indeed, it would be it will be a net consumer in that it produces 500 megawatts out, but the total consumption, I talked about 50 megawatts to heat mm. the fuel, the total consumption is actually about 600 and something, 650 megawatts. So it is a total consumer, but it, it's not designed to put electricity onto the grid. The, the scaling from, from, from ITER to a power station, you'd actually have to have something like a gigawatt thermal, but the 600 megawatts that you put in doesn't change very much. So it might be 650, but gigawatt thermal. So you'd then be a, a net producer. In fact, that's more or less the design parameters for the European power station design. But ITER was not designed to be a net electric producer. It was never part of the plan. Like I said, it's, a, it's an experiment to demonstrate things like when I was talking about before the dominance of the alpha particles, that's never been done before, needs to be done, needs to demonstrate that you get, you get a net power gain and you produce on commercial scale. And that's what it's designed to do. Okay, great. Um, uh, another interesting question here uh, from David uh, McGee. What methods are used to heat the plasma in the tokamak up to 150 million degrees? 
And do you think other types of fusion reactor like MTF reactors would be viable as a future power producing plant? Um, so very briefly, three main heating systems. Firstly, we pass a current through it, just like current goes through a light bulb, light bulb gets hot. We pass lots of current, millions of amps mm. through, through the fuel and it gets then to about 10 million degrees. And then we bump it from 10 million to 150 million through um, two main heating systems. One is an injection of particles, so a bit like a particle accelerator. So CERN, you accelerate particles to very high energies using charged grids. And then you pass them through a cloud of gas to neutralize them. Because they're neutral, they don't feel the magnets. They go into the middle of the fuel, at which point they'll collide and they might gain or lose an electron, at which point they're, they're charged. And then they start whizzing around and they pass on their energy to the fuel. So, so injection of particles and the, the third way is a bit like a fancy microwave. We propagate waves through the vacuum and when in your microwave they'd be resonant with the frequency of water, the natural frequency of water and it heats up the water in your chicken breast or whatever. Here we pass a, a wave through and it's, it's resonant with the natural oscillating frequency of the electrons or the ions and then it dumps all of its energy in, into the ions or electrons and that boosts the temperature up to 150 million degrees. So three different ways. Um, all used in concert effectively. I've forgotten the second part of the question. Yeah, um, um, rival MTF reactor, I think was the... Um, uh, yeah, the so, so there, are, there are different approaches to fusion. I've talked almost exclusively about using big magnets. There are uh, other ways that you can approach it by, um, for instance, compressing the fuel to mm. very, very high densities. So here we're trying to keep it going for a long time, but at low density. So our fuel is about 100 times thinner than air. So it has no sort of structural integrity. You can take the other approach of saying, well, we don't care that it doesn't last very long, but we'll compress to very high density and then you get a big gain as well. Or you can go somewhere in the middle, which is sort of a combination of this sort of target or magneto version. And, and there are people taking all different approaches. Um, currently, the, 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 the magnetic confinement that I've described today is furthest down the track. And so there is a machine, ETA's being built, ETA turns on in five years and getting close to technical demonstration. The other things are a little bit behind that, but they're certainly worth trying as well. Okay, thank you. And um, just a couple of uh, last questions, I think. Um, we've got one here um, from Jared. Uh, is helium shortage going to be a big problem for fusion reactor magnets? Or is it going to be doable with um, cooled superconductors? I guess uh, that comes back to when can you move to the high TC ver versions and not have to use helium? Like it. Yeah, ex exactly that, Peter. So, so actually, with on, on a global scale, we're not that big a consumer of helium, but we uh, we are currently assuming that we will will be able to supercool the, the magnets and long term, hopefully, high temperature superconducting magnets become available. Yeah, actually, well, I'll give you uh, two more questions. One uh, uh, interesting when I come to the end, but. Uh, about resources as well. I think someone asked the question about whether there's enough lithium around for your usage. Now, as uh, somebody that works on lithium batteries, I, I think that would be a question, a tougher question for me than for you, but uh, given the amount of lithium they're gonna use. But anyway, it's your talk, so let, I'll let you answer it in the context yeah, of- Maybe I'll ask you. So our consumption compared to batteries is very tiny, actually. So the, the, the amount of fuel that we need inside the reactor is grams, right? I talked about that sort of lithium in a laptop battery and water. So it's actually, there's not very much fuel in there. It's quite a big volume, but it's incredibly thin. So there's only a few tens of grams of fuel in there. So actually we don't need that much lithium on, on the scale of global consumption of lithium. It shouldn't be a big problem for us. Great, thank you. And an interesting question here from uh, someone who's a high school student in the US. Uh, I find this all very exciting. What can I do as a student to progress nuclear fusion? How can I learn more and get involved? Yeah, now is a great time to get into fusion because with, with the advent of ITER and the genesis of these power plant design programs and, and both governments and the private sector putting more resources into it, it's a fantastic time to join the field. And there's loads of routes in. There's a apprentice training schemes. We, we train about 300. We'll be doing about 1,000 a year. Um, we do um, entry as graduates, we do entry as PhD students, as postdocs at all levels, basically. And uh, there are lots of vibrant PhD courses and, and graduate courses in Fusion. So um, look it up. If you want to drop me a line afterwards, I can point you to some of those. That's super. Well, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great talk and I think a really great Q&A. And I want to thank all the people who have posted questions as well. Uh, apologies, I can't ask all of them. It's the nature of uh, these events that you always get a lot more questions than we have. We have time to deal with, but I, I hope all of you found that really stimulating, 
both in terms of Ian's talk and the uh, and the discussion that we've had. Ian, I'm sorry we would normally offer to take you out for dinner at this point, but that's not quite going to work. I mean, you're going to have to rely on Deliveroo or something instead, I'm afraid. But um, uh, I, I really do think that was a really great. Uh, I'll hold it great, in credit for you. <laughs> it's a great presentation, and uh, all I can say is uh, I think you uh, you rightly mentioned. Uh, uh, the tenfold improvement somewhere and uh, we'd be delighted if we could do that in batteries i can assure you uh, but thank you very much indeed um everyone has taken part in this event um, uh, and uh, i look forward to some of you joining us for future uh, future events of this type and again i'd just like to take the chance to uh, congratulate ian on the um, on receiving this cavley uh, uh Kavli award thank you it's very kind thank you very right. much so thank you all very much everyone bye-bye